Hey guys, what's up? It's Crum and welcome to video one, a brief history of Java. I think it's important for any, I think it's important for anybody learning Java uh, to actually know a bit of the history behind Java and its evolution over the years. So let's take a look at where Java is currently today. So today Java is one of the most used languages in the world. And this is very, very good for a language. And when you're looking to program in a language, it's something you want to look for. Uh, because it means it's good. If a lot of people are using it, then it's definitely a viable language to do uh, many different things in and has many different applications. Not only that, you're going to be able to find support easier. So if you ever run into an error, you're not sure how to do something. I mean, if you Google, <clears throat> if you just go ahead and Google a question that you have about Java, uh, the likelihood is, is that you're going to find multiple other people that have posted on forum boards and different sort of question, question answering sites. Uh, with that same answer, with that same question, and you'll find answers also posted. Uh, so it's really good uh, if you're looking to get into a language, especially if you're new, uh, because if you ever do come into something that you have trouble with, uh, <clears throat> you're definitely going to be able to find help for that very easily. Also, it also means that there's going to be a lot of pre-built libraries and a lot of pre-built code already done by other developers uh, who've likely shared it for free on places like GitHub for you to use to save you that work. Uh, and Java is getting stronger. So if we look at a lot of languages that were released around the same time as Java, they've become obsolete and they're dead and they're no longer useful. Uh, Java has actually continued to update their language and adapt to fit the needs of programmers for the current time. So Java's uh, innovated and they've made changes based on how other programming languages involved uh, to really keep their language relevant uh, throughout the aging of the years because Java is an old language. It was released uh, quite a long time ago. Not one of the oldest languages, uh, but it was definitely, it's definitely getting quite old now in 2016. Um, so Java is going to be a good bet for you if you're looking for a language that's going to last the next 20 years and still be relevant. So one thing we should always look at when we're delving into a new programming language is that programming language ancestry. So Java's ancestry uh, is actually deeply tied in with the C language. So Java is related to C++, and as we probably know, C++ is related to C. Um, so if we look at uh, the differences between Java and C++, we're not really going to see many. Uh, and this is mostly because Java was actually really a response to these two, predecessor, two predecessors. Uh, Java, uh, well, some microsystems at the time, seen these languages and they said, hey, those are good, and we're trying to solve this unique problem that we have here, but we, we realize that C++ and C are good languages. Uh, there's a few things that we'd like to change on those languages, uh, but definitely we're gonna go ahead and pretty much copy those. And that's what Java did. Um, they took the C++ language, they took the C language, they took like nearly every fundamental idea that these, these two languages uh, embody, and then they improved on them uh, making things uh, more easy for the developer to do. They improved ease of use and they improved functionality. So those are like the two key factors uh, that Java really um, kind of improved on from C++ and C. Also, we need to look at that Java was built to solve a problem that couldn't be solved by these two languages. Java wanted to have the ability to, to have this, uh, what they call write once, run anywhere um, type of deal to it. So when you write code in Java, you can run it on any computer that supports the Java virtual machine, as it's called, the JVM. Um, so that's the problem that Java solved, because at the time, uh, you had this kind of posing issue where, well, you can write a piece of code and run it on a website. However, if you haven't written specific code for that CPU, uh, and if that person's using that CPU, they're not going to be able to see their code. And this is kind of why Java got so big, is because you could write once and pretty much run on any computer anywhere in the world. Uh, so what I really want you to take away from this is that uh, Java is related to C++ and C, however, that's not a bad thing at all. It's actually an improvement on those languages. Uh, although, uh, given C++ and Java are two different languages and they both have their pluses, especially today where they've both been improved. Uh, not saying C++ is a bad language or anything, a really good language, you should learn it. So the next couple of slides, we're going to take a brief look at C and then C++. I'll try to spend a few minutes on each. Uh, so C was really the first step into what is now modern programming. Uh, it really changed the way that programming was thought about. It, it evolved up from assembly um, out of a need for a language that was efficient, structured, and high leveled. Uh, high level meaning that it's closer to English. If you look at assembly, that's like really like weird stuff. Like, you, holy crap. 
Um, so people are really tired of using the assembly language and uh, these other niche languages that we'll talk about in a second. Um, and so C was really a response to this. It was an answer to this need um, and it was really the replacement for creating a system level programs opposed to needing to use something like assembly. You know, back in the day, uh, when you were picking a language that you want to program in, or when developers were thinking about making a language, there was trade-offs that they had to think about. Uh, so back before, you know, C came around, if you were going to program an application, you would need to think about what traits you need that programming language to do, because it didn't fit all of them. So for example, although BASIC was easy to learn, uh, it lacked the power to be able to create these large applications that many industries at the time needed. Um, and we can also take a look at Fortran too, same way. It was really good at making scientific uh, applications because it was designed to, f to fit that specific need. Um, however, it was bad if you wanted to create something like a system level application. Um, and same goes with assembly too. Assembly, uh, although it was very efficient um, and it created good applications, it was really hindered by it being you know, too hard to learn and that if you wanted to ever debug something on it, um, it was very, very hard to do that. Um, so C kind of innovated on this and made a language uh, that was more feasible to do uh, multiple different things. With. So in the last slide, we kind of talked about how these languages only really fitted uh, very niche applications. Um, but there was also another problem that kind of occurred with these early programming languages. Um, and that is that they were not built on structured principles. They relied on things like GoTo. If you've ever programmed in Batch, you'll know they use GoTo to jump to different places in the code. And the problem with this is that it creates this kind of mess of tangled code, also known as spaghetti code, uh, that's very hard for anybody else to read. And once you start creating bigger applications and you forget what you did, like if you ever programmed before, uh, you'll write an application and then the next day you'll go back to it and you don't know how it works anymore because, you know, um, maybe you wrote some bad code and it's all spaghettied up and you didn't comment it right. Um, well, this was a big problem. Think about it. If you're working for a company and you have multiple developers and you're writing in something like Basic or Fortran, um, and you have like, you know, 3,000 go-to statements in there that are jumping all over the place, it becomes very, very hard to understand. So this was a problem that C had to solve. So as we can see, there was this growing need for a language that solved these problems. So in the 1970s, when the computer revolution really started happening, uh, the demand for software eventually exceeded the ability for programmers to produce it. They couldn't produce the software fast enough. Um, and so efforts started being placed into actually creating a language that was better. And also because computers were becoming more accessible, it gave people the time to tinker with them. Uh, instead of being computers that were locked behind, I don't know, university doors or that had maybe an hour a week with them, uh, people started having them in their own homes and they could spend many hours programming on them and creating things with them. So we talked about the problems that C had to uh, kind of overcome and the problems that it would solve. And so it was eventually uh, actually developed in the 1970s by a fellow named Dennis Ritchie, his picture is right here, uh, and his colleague Ken Thompson. Uh, so a little bit about C, it started from a language called BCPL, and BCPL was influenced from a language called B. I don't really know too much about those languages, um, but uh, really B led to a development uh, process which ended with C. Um, so yeah, it solved the problems of the past languages. This was like one of the first, well, this was the first language to my knowledge that was powerful, efficient, structured, and easy to learn. Um, and really that kind of stems from, because prior to this, languages were designed by academics and universities. They weren't really kind of meant for programmers. Um, but C was developed by programmers for programmers. Uh, and as such, it kind of it kind of quickly took over and became this language that was widely used, and uh, everybody kind of kind of loved. Um, and see, and we'll see that Java also took this and ran with it, and that's really why Java uh, makes such a good language because it's designed by programmers for programmers, and as such, it makes a good language to program with. So now that we've learned the background of C, we can jump into C++. Uh, and C++, once again, was one of the languages that Java was heavily influenced by. So C quickly became the dominant language uh, between 1970 and 1980. However, during that, you know, like eight, 10 years, um, there, there uh, kind of arise this new need and that was uh, because of complexity. Um, and just a little aside here, C is still used today, still a great language. Um, but C really uh, kind of lacked that, that new need for complexity which arised. Uh, and this is because programs started become, becoming more and more complex. They were longer and they did more things and they need to accomplish more. 
Um, and so better ways to handle this complexity uh, were needed. Um, so C was really a response to this new need. Uh, and if you want to think about complexity, you can kind of think about it this way. So when computers were first invented, and maybe you can think back to Alan Turing's machine, um, you would need to punch in your code manually using levers and buttons and things of the sort. Um, and that was fine as long as you're only doing maybe two, three hundred button pushes. Uh, but after that, it kind of becomes unmanageable. Um, so when they got to that point where it was unmanageable to be pressing all these buttons, they started using uh, like symbolic representations like punch cards uh, to start entering in this code so you could write longer and more complex programs. And once those punch cards when they were unfeasible anymore because you had massive stacks of them, right, like, you know, 2,000 punch cards long, um, we started using uh, actually digital symbolic representations. Um, so every time that the complexity increases, there had to be this need to fit it. And C in itself was a response too to the complexity of this new complexity that was faced by wanting to create programs that did more than just scientific applications. So what happened was by the 1980s, programmers and their programs started pushing the limits of structured programming. And as you know, C is a structured programming language. That was their innovation. They made it structured. Uh, so they were pushing it past the limits of what it was capable of. Um, so to kind of fix this problem, a new kind of paradigm of programming was, well, started being invented known as OOP or Object Orientated Programming. Uh, so while C is really a great language, being structured, there is a point where one can't grasp the entirety of the program. It gets too big and it gets too complex. You can't understand fully what it does. Where this line of ununderstanding occurs at uh, is arbitrary, though, because it really depends on the programmer and the program that you're writing. Uh, but any normal human eventually will not be able to understand what the program fully does in structured programming. It just gets too big. Um, so C++ uh, was a response to this need. It came out of it, and it implemented features um, that are now known as object-oriented programming. It didn't implement them all, but it definitely imp implemented some uh, at the time uh, that really broke this threshold and allowed programmers to make more complex applications than they could when they were using structured programming. So kind of in conclusion here about C++, it was made by a fellow named Bajaran Strustrap. I'm not 100% sure on the pronunciation there, it's German, uh, but he created the language in 1979, and he originally called it C with classes. However, however, in 1983, this was then changed to C++, because really, all C++ did was improve on C. It kept all of C's features, all of its functions, and all it did was add to it uh, what was needed to get past uh, this complexity issue which arised. Uh, he did not try to reinvent the wheel here, that's not what people wanted. He didn't make a new programming language, all he did was improve on C, and that's why it was really so successful. It was something that people liked, it was something that was really good and really worked well, um, but it had this complexity issue, issue that arised in like the 1980s, and uh, so C++ fixed this problem. So we've now learned about C and we've learned about C++ and it's really important to understand those things and where they come from and how they evolved if you want to understand deeply uh, why Java was invented and why the functionality behind it and how it's written in the syntax is all why it is. It's important to go over those things and that's why I spent like 10 minutes on them. Uh, but now that we know that, uh, we can actually start getting into some history of Java. So the need for Java arised after C++, much like how there was a need uh, for C to be created, and then C was created, and from C, a new need arised, and C++ came about. So in the 1980s to the 1990s, object-oriented programming using C++ was really the big thing. Everybody was doing it, everybody was writing their programs in it, and it really kind of seemed like this perfect language, like there was never going to need to be another language. Uh, than C++. This one really did it all. Uh, however, history repeated itself again and a new need came about and this was, uh, this was a need caused by the traction of the internet starting to take place. So the internet started to gain popularity and more and more people were using it and as such this started to brew this new massive need and revolution in programming which Java ends up fixing here and ends up uh, kind of stepping in and arising from this need. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the creation of Java. So Java was created by a company called Sun Microsystems in 1991. Well, it was conceived by a company called Sun Microsystems in 1991. And it was actually originally called Oak, the language, uh, but they renamed it to Java later in 1995. The original problem that Java was trying to solve was actually not the internet, as I mentioned earlier, uh, but that would end up being why it got so popular is the internet. Um, so the so the so what they wanted to do what 
Sun Microsystems wanted to do is they wanted to make a, a programming language that was platform independent uh, so they could use it in various different consumer electronics uh, such as microwaves and remote controls. Now the real problem here though is that when you take a look at remote controls and microwaves and different things like that is that these items use a variety of different CPUs and when you have a programming language the compiler for that programming language compiles it for that specific CPU. So if you want it to take an item like a remote control and compile code on it, uh, you need to have a specific compiler for that CPU. Um, and that's kind of where the problem with C and C++ comes in if you want to do something like this for those consumer electronics. Uh, with C and C++ and almost all their languages, they are designed to be compiled on specific CPUs. They're not made to be compiled on some little tiny weird niche CPU that's in your remote control. So, however, Though it is possible to compile code on these CPUs, if you want to make a compiler for it, it would cost a lot of money and it would be very time consuming and that just isn't feasible to do for something like some weird niche Chinese CPU in a remote control. You don't want to do that. So there was this need uh, that Java saw, given it was a small need but they want to solve it, uh, to create a easier and more cost friendly solution uh, for compiling code on these different CPUs because there was a need for it given a small need. Um, so this led the Sun Microsystems working on a language which is now known as Java that was portable and platform independent. So this would allow code to be produced that would run on a variety of CPUs under differing environments. This would solve the problem of needing to make a new compiler for every CPU that you want it to compile on. So Java with consumer electronics fixed the issue of not having a platform independent language to run code on them. Um, so had the web not come around, Java really would have been left as a useful but rather niche language uh, for these consumer electronics. However, the web propelled Java really uh, because it also needed portable programs. At the time on the web, there was three main computer systems that were using it, uh, and that being Intel, Macintosh, and Unix. Uh, so since these different systems all wanted to be using the same applications, applications thanks to the internet, there was now this increased need for a language that was portable, that is platform independent. And Sun Microsystem realized that this problem was here and that they had already solved this problem for consumer electronics. And finally, in conclusion here, the internet is really what led Java to its large scale success. Java designers knew that using the familiar syntax of C and using the object oriented programming a paradigm of C++ would make Java appealing to programmers familiar with C++ and C, which there was a lot of at the time. And also, like C and C++, Java was also made by real programmers, so it wasn't made by some academic university somewhere. Uh, it was made by real programmers, so it had a real use in programming. It was made by them, for them, and as such, it made a good language for it. And finally, also Java enhanced on the object oriented principles that were being used by C++, which was very important. In the next video, we're going to be talking about uh, Java's bytecode. Uh, we're going to be talking about the portability behind it, the security behind it, the Java virtual machine, all things Java, and why it does what it does well, and why it's so unique, and why, it, you know, basically the reasons behind, the technical reasons behind why Java is so big, and why it's so useful, and why it's such a good language to learn. Uh, thank you guys for next time. Until next time, the peace in chicken grease.